Hey, everybody, and welcome back to our next Leadership Lessons uh, interview series here in combination with Comparably and Entrepreneur.com. I'm Jason Nazar, the co-founder and CEO of Comparably, and I am just really happy today to have with us an amazing guest, Neeraj Shah. What's up, Neeraj? How are you doing? I'm doing great. Uh, th thank you for having me today. Excited to be here. Thank you for joining us. I, have, as I told you, a big fan, a customer for a long time. I've just been so amazed and impressed to see what you've built with this business over the past many years and so excited to dive in. For those of you joining us here for the first time, this is a series that we do with an incredible set of leaders like Neeraj, where we talk about leadership lessons, where we have an if I knew then conversation. Again, my name is Jason Nazar. I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've started and sold a couple of different companies and uh, today run Comparably, which is an employee review platform and a SaaS platform to help companies with their recruitment marketing, employer branding. And I've had the good privilege of learning so much from so many incredible mentors and CEOs. And I know the same is going to be true today, Neeraj. And so I think everyone listening today is going to be super familiar with your brand and probably as a customer, but would love for you to explain Wayfair as you do today in your own words. Well, you know, with Wayfair, where our goal is to be the go-to platform for all things home. Our aim is to connect all the suppliers who, who are designing and making all the goods available that let you turn your uh, yeah, house into a home with you as the customer and make it easy for you to find that perfect item. Love that. Now, the thing that stood out to me, you know, I've, I've talked and written a lot about this co-founder relationship. And if I don't have this, if I have this right, I think your co-founder been known for quite a number of years. Did the two of you go actually go to high school together? Well, it, actually, we went to college together, but we met between our junior and our senior years of high school because we both attended a summer program at Cornell University. And then coincidentally, a year later, we ended up a few doors apart on our freshman year floor. And so then we reconnected and became friends. And, and here we are, you know, a long time later. Can you talk about that co-founder relationship? Obviously, that's got to be some of the DNA and secret to the success of Wayfair. And it's such a special and intimate relationship and one that if founders and entrepreneurs get right, makes all the difference. And, and when you get it wrong, can be a massive deterrent. You know, what are the ingredients that, you know, you would tell somebody is this is the recipe for how you know that you've got the right co-founder or co-founders and what's been so special and unique in, in your two relationship over these many years? You know, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky relationship in the sense that typically you, you start a company with either folks you don't know particularly well or folks where you're, you're friends, but the working relationship might be something new or the co-founding relationship, certainly something new. You know, for us, it worked out really well. We obviously liked each other prior, um, and I'd say we trusted each other's judgment prior. Um, but what we learned over time is we also gravitated to different areas of the business that our skills were highly complementary, and that the 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 trusting each other extended to to deep business judgment. And so that combination ended up making for a really powerful combination. And I tend to think that you know the partnerships that that kind of fall in that way work great. The ones where there's either competition around what what role different folks have, or where you know um, maybe one of the folks doesn't trust the other one's judgment. Those ones tend to get very complicated, tend not to work out. Yeah. All right. So you talked about meeting in Cornell. I'd, I'd like to go back to there to start. You were an engineer by trade, right? Yes. Yep, exactly. And so when did you know that you wanted to pursue entrepreneurship? Was it something that you grew up in a household where your parents were entrepreneurs? What gave you the bug? And when did you know that was going to be your path? You know, I, I never thought of entrepreneurship as a career option, but I was always entrepreneurial, you know, started that lawn mowing business in my neighborhood. I had the paper route. Um, my parents were entrepreneurial in the sense that my dad, you know, my parents grew up in India. My dad came to the U.S., you know, place that where he really didn't know very many people and came here for his graduate degree, decided to stay, married my mother who came over to the U.S. Um, my, uh, my mother's father started his own manufacturing business in India. So there's a kind of a history of being entrepreneurs in the family. But it, when I was in college, it wasn't clear that that was a career option per se. And so I sort of fell into it. Yeah. And so talk, talk about falling into it because you had started, I believe, a IT consulting company with your co-founder today, right? And so. Exactly. What, what led you down that path versus maybe looking to take a traditional job? I mean, like you, I share, you know, immigrant parent and uh, for somebody that was entrepreneur his whole life, my dad so stressed education. 
And so I think when, you know, I was starting a company in my mid twenties, you know, he was a little upset that I wasn't going a traditional path of, of being an attorney of which I'd gone to law school. So what was that experience like for you? Well, you know, so I would say my parents very much stressed education. And so the way, um, you know, in the era in which I grew up, a lot of the focus on education was then to either become a doctor or a lawyer. Those were the kind of two de risk paths to a good, stable career that, you know, kind of a large investment in education sort of rewarded you with that stability of that good, successful career. And, you know, by process of elimination, I didn't want to be a doctor. So I decided I wanted to be a lawyer. And so my, my path, I had uh, studied engineering at Cornell as an undergraduate student. I ended up applying to graduate engineering uh, schools as well as law schools. And ultimately, I ended up accepting a one-year master's program at MIT and deferring Georgetown Law School. And that was, that was my plan. What ended up happening is the last semester at Cornell, the spring of 95, um, we were taking an entrepreneurship course at Cornell. At the time, it was the only one they offered. And through the coursework, you create a business plan. You do the research and create a business plan. And through that, um, that was sort of the beginning of the commercial internet, the spring of 95. We ended up writing a business plan around internet-related business. And, and effectively, through the research, one thing led to another. We ended up with some customers asking us to build web applications for them. We ended up deciding to do that. We gave it the summer. And we ended up getting a project from Time Warner. And you know, one thing we decided to then let, let's let's go after it. And so in my mind, I said, well, let's give it a year. So I, I won't end up going to MIT, which which obviously for uh, you know, a, you know, a son of an engineer, that's not uh, you know necessarily a super e easy thing to to pass on. Um, and but I my view was hey, I could always just go back to law school in a year's time. I'd already deferred it for a year. And Honestly, it was super exciting and we were working long hours, and we, but we were able to keep building up the business. And so I, as you would surmise, I never did attend law school either, but uh, that, that was sort of the journey, beginning of the journey. Yeah. So I, I want to jump ahead for a moment because I think it's so rare that somebody's lived through all these different cycles that you have. And so obviously like the rise of the internet and the, you know, first, you know, crash and in, in 2001, and then what we all live, a lot of us live through in 2008, now going through the pandemic, you know, seeing all these different cycles, like how does that inform your leadership style? And, you know, what perspective do you think it gives you that maybe a lot of folks that have, you know, just seen the boom times here the last couple of years as, as venture backed entrepreneurs or even public companies? What's that different perspective you have there? Well, I think if you zoom out, you know, we're in the middle of a 50 year technology transformation, which is really on the back of the internet, so this global network of devices, and the fact that we all carry a smartphone, you know, in our pocket or in our bag, uh, you know, very powerful computer. And we're, you know, 25 years in and, you know, I don't know, let's make it up, say we're halfway into it, and there's still so much opportunity ahead. That said, none of that obviates the traditional economic cycles and kind of uh, basic rules of economics that I tend to think of as like rules of physics. And, you um, I tend to think in boom time, sometimes it's easy to start thinking that those won't apply. And when you're young, you have a limited amount of business experience. And so I think sometimes the very recent period might be the entirety of your experience. And so therefore you just extrapolate from that. And I, all I would just say is what I've seen over time is, you know, in good times, everyone does well. And it's in the rockier times that, that frankly, companies can, they can take share, they can out execute their competitors. It's the rockier times that separate the companies from each other. And so my views as an entrepreneur, those are opportunities that you want to take advantage of because customers, they don't, they don't fully disappear. It's just tougher to get a customer. Customers are more discerning, but this is also an opportunity. So that's, that's, that's kind of the, what I would point to and how I think about it. Yeah. I, I'd love to go to that first year of Wayfair. You know, obviously you were early to the game, but it was still competitive in e-commerce. You have a very complicated business where you're dealing with a large amount of suppliers you're dealing with large goods. Uh, it's a new category for a lot of people at that time. What did you do in that first year to really establish product market fit? Or maybe it took longer than that. And, and how did you get those early set of customers when other companies that were in that same space were tr struggling to do what you were doing? Well, you know, we started the company in 2002, and at the time, the first decade, we were known as CSN Stores, and we didn't yet have the Wayfair brand name. And so we launched an independent website for each category. And so we, from a product market fit standpoint, we were able to start in a very focused way. So the very, very first website was called racksandstands.com. We told, sold TV stands, speaker stands. 
And frankly, that was the early days of Google AdWords. Yahoo had a similar product called Overture. And we were able to very, you know, on a target basis, market to customers who we knew were in market. We were focused on having the best selection and the best service. We thought those things uh, particularly mattered. And what we were able to do, we found, was by focusing on those things, outcompete the others who, as you said, you always have competition. So the others who are selling in the category. And so we kind of honed our recipe focusing on the things that we think mattered. And then we, what we did is one by one, we started expanding categories. And as simple as this model sounds, it's, it's a lot to do because uh, what happens is you're adding a lot of selection from a lot of suppliers. You're trying to understand inventory levels, even though it's not your own inventory. Then as things ship, you're trying to make sure you can manage and track the shipping. You're trying to then handle any customer inquiries. You're trying to have the best product uh, information, the merchandising content. And so execution wise, it's not an easy business, but the underlying recipe is easy to get your head around. And retail is a very old profession and you understand it. People want to buy things, they need to buy from someone who can, who can give them a good offer and then deliver on it. And, um, you know, there's a, there's a vast supply of goods out there in the categories we focus on. So by managing the execution to be super tight, we were able to build the business and bootstrap it over time. And I think where kind of maybe what made us good at it is that we were pretty smart about knowing what mattered and what didn't matter and uh, putting all our energy into the things that did. Yeah. You know, today it seems commonplace to go online and, and buy goods for your house, whether it's a couch or a bed or a dresser, but there was a time where that seemed very foreign to a lot of folks. You know, how did you think about getting over that curve? And, and, and even today, how do you kind of capture all those customers that might otherwise think, well, you know, for certain items, I'd still prefer to go into a store. You know, our feeling is that there's always going to be some customers who maybe wouldn't have the comfort for that particular purchase online. But what we're finding is we improve the merchandising content or we offer fabric swatches or experts you can talk to on the phone or better and better imagery, 3D models. What happens is the percentage who would be wary of making that purchase online keeps shrinking. The Wayfair brand also adds credibility, the quality of our delivery experience, um, you know, the quality of our customer service. So we keep working at, at making this more and more attainable and addressable. And then we obviously, we sell obviously through our website and our apps, but we then augment that. We have print catalogs, for example, we mail to folks and other, other, other things that, you know, perhaps they have a much longer history of having comfort with that also make this feel very attainable. Yeah. And so as you look out over the next five to 10 years and just retail as a category, you know, we had Dick Johnson, the CEO of Foot Locker on as a previous guest here recently, and, and he gave his point of view too just so fascinated to get your sense of what retail is going to look like because, you know, it was already going through such a massive shift and then COVID just accelerated that so much. And so what, what is going to be the place of brick and mortar retail, you know, five, 10 years from today for your category and other categories? We believe brick and mortar retail is, is going to be there. We don't think it's going away. And what we do to believe that is we look at some early adopter categories like office supplies or consumer electronics, where you find that they grew online super rapidly in the early days. But then as they asymptoted, it was around a 50-50 mix. I think one of them is 40-60, they're 60-40. And when we think about our categories where there, there's a big visual element, but there's also a tactile element, uh, certain items you may want to sit on or a mattress you want to lay on or may want to work with a professional who helps you with design choices. We think the brick and mortar rule is certainly there. So our mental model is let's think about it being 50-50. And over time, how do we make sure that we're participating on both sides of it? So we're not just the leader online, but how do we make sure we're the leader with stores as well? And frankly, not treat them as two separate things, treat them as a combined experience. So then all you're doing is deepening the ways in which customers can interact with you, the ways in which customers can choose um, what is the right experience for them today. And frankly, our goal would be that they were their go-to for everything home. Yeah, it, it, it's just so unbelievably rare for a founder to still be running a company as they take it to a public company and after all these years. And, you know, I just deeply admire and respect what you've accomplished in so many regards, but certainly this one. And I, I remember when I was, you know, in my late twenties and I was two years into running this previous venture back business I had started that we sold into it, you know, our, my VCs told me, well, we'll see as if the company grows, you know, you'll, you're still the right person to be CEO, which I just thought was so Weird. I'm like, well, why would I ever not be the CEO of this company? You know, 
having been through so many different chapters and cycles of the business, as you think of who you were as a leader when you first started versus who you are today, what, what are the biggest changes? How, how have you evolved as a leader and a CEO after all these decades? Well, I mean, every, every new experience broadens your horizons. And so, you know, my view is the, the best leaders are the ones who are always learning, who don't presuppose that they know the answer, but at the same time, they use pattern recognition from everything they've learned in the past and then they apply it to the current situation. So you're, you're neither thinking everything is new, nor are you assuming you know the answer to everything. You're, it's, a, it's like some combination of the two. And um, what I would say is also, you know, we've had a healthy belief that as the company grows and succeeds, you know, there's a set of cultural traits that we've identified that we don't believe should ever change. So we think we got to fight to protect. But there's a lot of ways we manage the business and processes and approaches and, and, and things that do need to evolve. And so being open to changing things and being uh, particularly keen to try to identify when maybe um, a system isn't working as well as it used to. So maybe now's the time to proactively think about what needs to change. That's been a, that's been a big uh, trait uh, that's driven success for us. And what are those culture traits that haven't changed? What are the what are those fundamentals for you at Wayfair? Yeah, so we we want to have a culture where people honestly enjoy working with each other, but at the same time, we want to have a culture where everyone is expected to be productive and and whatever area of the business they own or whatever their role is, we expect them to to really work hard at it and be successful at it. Um, constantly look to to think about how it can evolve, how they can do better. So there's, on one hand, there's a very tight uh, collaborative and uh, kind of a almost fun aspect to the culture. And at the same time, there's an expectation of productivity and excellence that's there. And that combination, I think, has worked very well for us. And so as you get bigger, sometimes people say, oh, you should change your expectations or um, the collaborative nature, some folks, a lot of larger companies are not as collaborative. And so people try to replace uh, raw collaboration with, uh, with process, uh, a steering committee, uh, annual budget, some sort of advisory committee. And we've generally been averse to that. You know, why can't we take really bright talent folks and entrust them with a topic and expect them to figure out a solution? So that, so there's been some things we've stuck to like that, that we believe in. Yeah. And what are the characteristics that you most look forward to? in a team member, you know, if you're, when you're doing an interview of a candidate, you know, and you meet someone exceptional, how how do you know that she's the right fit for Wayfair? We want folks who, they need to be very talented. They need to be very ambitious. Um, We use a lot of data. So we want folks who sort of have interest in data and know how to, you know, be analytically minded. And, you know, that's something they, they, they care about. Um, you know, I talked on the collaborative aspects. That's really important. And then we embrace technology throughout the whole company. So we don't expect everyone to know how to build technology, but folks who are curious about and think about technology um, and who enjoy technology t- tend to also uh, do well here. Yeah. You know, we're living through a time today where it's never been this hard to hire and retain talent. You know, I think we're in the midst of a seismic generational change in the future of work. Uh, how, how do you think about, like, what do you do differently in the hiring process, both to recruit candidates that have a lot of choices, but what are the unique things that you do at Wayfair to also still screen candidates today to find out who's that right fit for you? You know, so I would say, obviously, we're, we're vetting uh, a candidate against their expectations for a given role. But I'd say what we've done that I think is particularly our strength is all the cultural traits I mentioned a minute ago. During an interview process, we have certain of the interviewers focus on culture fit, and we have certain of the interviewers focus on skill fit. And what we try not to do is let the two um, mix, get mixed up because we're looking for a yes on both. And um, sometimes um, if you're trying to think about them both at the same time, you, you know, you notice that someone is exemplary on one or the other and you sort of um, maybe don't pay attention to the other. And so we sort of do a little bit of divide and conquer and trying to figure that out. Yeah, I love that. And so when you have an opportunity to interview a candidate directly for a role, what are some of your unique go to questions? What are the two or three things that you ask that maybe over the years you kind of picked up and learned that help you assess a candidate maybe? you know, wouldn't be part of a standard interview otherwise? I mean, a lot of what I'm interested in is just trying to get to know the person. Like, so I try to learn about, you know, when I look at their career history, sort of not so much what they've done, but kind of 
you know, what was that, prog- the why behind their progression? You know, what, what, what is it that they were seeking out? What is it that they were hoping to discover and accomplish? Then I try to talk about where they want to be. And rather than talk about where they want to be in two or three years, I try to talk about where they want to be in five or 10 years. I'm curious about how they think about that. So, I, you know, I, I, I try to do a few things that, um, you know, frankly, I think are a little different than how others think about it. So Neeraj, one of the questions I always ask our guests is the time machine question. So if you could take a time machine back into your 20s, what piece of advice are you giving yourself and why? You know, I'd, I'd say the the first piece of advice is, um, it's going to sound uh, uh, pr- pretty simple, but, you know, every the team matters a lot. And so you're going to, on one hand, put a ton of energy into, into uh, putting together the right team. But the specific piece of advice I would give folks is, occasionally, no matter how good you become at hiring and trying to identify the right talent, there's going to be times where someone's not the right fit. And it took me a a long uh, stretch to finally realize that as soon as you notice that, it's better to talk about it sooner rather than later. Because otherwise, you know, you're not doing yourself a service as a manager. That's your responsibility. You're not doing the person a service because, you know, they obviously want to be somewhere where they're succeeding and you're not giving them the feedback or telling them it's not the right fit. And then you're letting down all the other teammates who basically probably see that this person's struggling and they're having to carry the weight. And despite that, because it's the least fun aspect of being a manager, um, it's human nature to put it off. And I think the advice is to to basically, if you want to be a manager and leader, that's your responsibility. And I'd say it took a while to fully internalize that. And that's still something that I find myself and other senior folks still grapple with. And so it's just a constantly a, a good reminder, I think. Yeah, I very much relate to that. I remember feeling in my 20s, like it was my job to help make people successful and that if they weren't working out, I was failing. And I think I learned that lesson as well. When you have those conversations today, because there's a real art to it. And I think you said something that's really important, which is, hey, this may just not be the right fit. It's not that you're not going to do great and successful in a different environment. The person that is amazing at soccer may not be amazing at basketball or golf. And so what's the secret of having those conversations to make sure that both parties are aligned and that the teammate knows that, you know, they can and will be successful in other environments going forward? I think the easiest thing, if you can just start giving someone feedback early on, positive and negative feedback, it's helping them understand what they need to work on versus saving it all up. And then you have a big bang conversation that, you know, well, I haven't shared this with you. I've been watching for X and Y and I haven't seen it happen. And because then you're running the risk of it being a real surprise. You're undermining the chance that the person could have worked at it and been very successful. And the nature of it being a surprise, you know, frankly, you know, can often get to that kind of the, the conversation being much, much tougher. So I, that's the the very first thing. I, and, and I think just being, being really, honest, being kind while you're being very honest is, I think, the way, the way to do it. Um, because if you try to sugarcoat things and you're very vague, you're not really giving someone a chance to work on things because you're not being clear. Okay. All right. Same question a decade later. If you could take a time machine back into your 30s, what piece of personal or professional advice are you giving yourself and why? I'd say the thing that I came to realize in my 30s is this, this point, you know, I'm married, we have children, raising a family, um, your demands on your time increase. And so it used to be, you know, I, you know, work and then I had my social life and it's sort of I could work a lot and still uh, maintain a social life. But then when you um, add in family, you, the, the demands on your time, frankly, increase. And I would say, you know, learning how to manage your time to be productive and to prioritize the things that you want to prioritize, learning how to say no to things or learning how to allocate time in a very um, judicious and thoughtful way around whatever your priorities are. I think it's just, uh, it takes a while to get good at that. And usually you get yourself oversubscribed a couple of few times and you get yourself maybe missing some things that you wish you had done um, to figure that out. But I'd say time management was maybe a really key thing that I learned and typically, you know, the lessons I'm telling you, I've learned through making the mistakes. Now, you give someone the advice, they try to avoid those mistakes. Often you still learn through those mistakes. But I'd say time management would be the advice for the third. When do you start your day and when do you end it today? Um, typically, um, you know, I'm usually getting up, you know, 6, 6 a.m. Or, or so. And a lot of that is, you know, the kids are still uh, headed out of the house to school. 
and then I'm then I'm in the office. Um, and then I try to when I'm not traveling, I try to have dinner with the family. So I try to make it home for dinner. Um, and so I won't stay at the office particularly late, but then after dinner, I'll, I'll pull out my laptop and, 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 and get back on. So it's um, my day sort of starts at six and ends, you know, I probably go to bed around 10 PM on average, um, 10, 10 to 10 30. Um, and then the work sort of, it's obviously the heady part of the day, but then again, after dinner with uh, some time carved out for, um, you know, our kids are now teenagers. So frankly, dinner is a good chance to catch up and, you know, they kind of have lives of their own as well. Yeah. I'm curious to get the actual tactics and maybe growth hacks that you do on time management. I'll share a couple maybe on my side as thought starters. So one of the things I've evolved to is really trying to group as many of my internal meetings as possible in a single time block. And so that it saves me more time for the areas that I might need to do individual contribution. Um, I will block out in my calendar time for tasks that I and items I need to do myself. So it's there in the calendar and, and you know, I know that I need to prioritize it. I really try to look at meetings that could and should be 15 minutes that might otherwise get put on the calendar for half an hour, 45 minutes. I encourage, for example, everyone in our company for first screens of candidates to do it for 15 minutes and not for 45 minutes because that can be a, a big area. What are some things either like that of your own that you do to help give yourself back time to work yeah. on the most important things? Um, so I've become a lot more... Um, an external, um, external related, non directly business impacting uh, thing. So speaking at a university or a conference, or I, I, I've kind of gone to where, um, by and large, I don't do those things very often. And so it's the rare exception. And what, what I found I was doing is, because it was many months away, and the calendar was open, I would say yes. Mm -hmm. But when it came around, of course, it's busy at that point, and I'm, I'm regretting what it's now I've made a commitment of a multi-hour type event. Um, I, similarly, I've, I've tried to keep more and more of my evenings free. So I travel for work, but when I'm in town, I try to keep the evenings free. That's both so that I can have dinner with the family. But then, frankly, that evening time is some uh, when I'm reading and catching up on some documents that I maybe are for a meeting coming the next day or the next few days. And often during the day, even uh, trying to be judicious on meetings, as you described, sometimes the days get full. And so, I'm, you know, I'd rather be reading that, you know, after dinner before I can get to bed at a reasonable hour rather than coming back from an event and, and still having um, work or my meetings the next day are less productive. Um, so that that's something um, that I've done. Uh, your comment about meetings is really good. I, I go through and at least once a year, but usually multiple times a year, I actually try to look through my meetings and try to reimagine what the schedule could look like. If, if none of them existed, what would need to exist? How would I structure it? Are there some that could be merged together? Are there some frequency changes we could make? Um, uh, you know, a big one a couple of years ago we made is, you know, I found that the number of different business reviews we were doing for different areas of the business had grown and some were quarterly and some were monthly and some were biannual and some were longer, some were shorter. And what we found is that, you know, the number of people who you wanted to have in these different ones were growing. The materials for some of them had mushroomed. And so we came up with a process twice a year over a span of a seven or eight days. We do the business reviews for everywhere in the, in, in the mm -hmm. business, but it's a 20 minute session for each. There's a five page pre-read that's created for each. And then there's a debrief session at the very end after we go through it's it's it's, it's about seven to eight days of three to four hours worth of meetings per day. And we do that a little bit so you still have time free those days and a little bit so that we can accommodate folks on different time zones. And what, what it basically lets us do, it gets us all back on one page. You find themes much more clearly because you're doing them all in the same period of time. Uh, the debrief session is very productive and we kind of, we net eliminated more meetings than we created. And so that, that's an example of something that came out of sort of this kind of uh, zero-based thinking of what it, what could what could it be? Ignore what we've got for now, just for a minute. What could it be? Yeah. How many direct reports do you have today? Um, not very many. So I believe I have five. And um, what I've found is um, that, that I've tr that's an evolution over time. But what I've tried to do is places where I was sort of becoming an extra person having to be involved in that conversation because two different individuals reported to me. And I said, well, hey, let's create a reporting structure that, that has efficiency built into it. And on certain topics, I'm, I, I joined for meetings anyways. It's not strictly done by who's in the reporting chain or who reports to who. 
Um, but let's also try to streamline the organizational structure and constructs that we can be as nimble and as agile as possible. And, and so for those five direct reports or other folks that you find yourself spending a fair amount of time with, when you do coaching for them these days, and these are folks at right, the highest levels of an organization with thousands of employees, what are the themes and topics that you find yourself coaching your direct reports on, even as they're really far and successful in their career? Honestly, the single biggest one often is you can sometimes see things when you're a couple layers away than the person who's closer to it can, because they know a lot more, they're closer to it. Um, they also have a lot of empathy for the folks who maybe report to them who are working really hard at something, but perhaps from farther away, you can notice headway isn't being made. Maybe you can even see why you think that is. You may or may not be correct, but so some of the feedback is, is around that. And then some of the feedback ends up coming out of what I get the vantage point of seeing, kind of having a limited amount uh, uh, of insight, but insight into everything. And I can connect dots sometimes that can help speed up the connection of dots for, for the folks who report to me. Um, they're generally, you know, have great command of their areas. They're driving them really hard. So rare, you know, occasionally I'll have kind of an innovative idea that I can share with them, but, but most of the time it's around, you know, how are, how are we taking ground and making headway on the things we want and, Perhaps there are things I'm seeing either through the connection of dots or from a vantage point that I have that can be helpful and maybe save us some time. Yeah. You know, you all have got really good scores on comparably around culture. And I, I think we can both agree it's, it's never been as important maybe ever for employees and candidates what company cultures are. You know, how, how do you think about continuing to build a great culture at Wayfair and and, and how would you describe your culture today? Yeah, so I think culture matters a lot. I think it's a very big piece of why we've been successful. And the way we look at it is as you get larger, our view is your culture is destined to change and erode unless you fight to protect it. And mm -hmm. wh why do I think that's the case? Well, as you get bigger, you hire folks. They come from other companies. Every other company has their own culture. Every individual maybe is used to certain ways of working. And if you want to keep certain attributes of your culture, it, you need to make sure folks not only are aligned with it, but then frankly, they understand exactly what you want to do so that everyone doesn't start to maybe build a slightly different version in their own areas in the business. <laughs> the last piece I'd say about the culture is some of what we prize are things that are harder to keep as you get larger. And so the natural evolution of things would move away from them if you don't fight for them. And what do I mean by that? Well, we, we prize being very entrepreneurial. So we try to create an environment where there's a lot of um, collaboration. So you're expected to really work with all the peer groups across the company and understand what they need and have them understand what you need and work together collaboratively. But at the same time, you have a lot of autonomy and independence. And that's the parallel pathing that allows us to be very entrepreneurial and do more things in parallel. We think that's been a big piece of how we've succeeded, but that's harder to execute. What a lot of companies do is they go to more command and control. Each silo maybe is its own thing. Then they create review committees, steering committees, approvals, annual budgets. They create structure to try to get things to work. And that structure can take risk out, but it does it at the cost of creating a dramatic decrease in speed. And our view is that speed, you know, agility, speed is really critical to succeeding. So we said, well, we, we don't want to give that up. So what we're going to do is we're going to kind of put the onus to keep things coordinated on the individuals. And that's difficult. And we're going to tell them that they then need to worry about not just what they want to get done, but what all the others who come to them with things they need from their team want to get done as well. And then they need to make decisions that are good for the company overall. And then if they have a hard time, the expectation is that they need to escalate things very quickly. So others who maybe have a broader purview can opine very quickly, but that the only way we're going to stay this entrepreneurial, frankly, is if we all work hard at it. And so there's certain attributes about our culture of, you know, we certainly prize people who work hard, but we want kind, nice people. And so there's different aspects of our culture that we care a lot about. And we feel like that gets us very far. So we, we fight to protect it. Yeah. And so as you think about the next 10 years, you, you've got, as we talked about earlier, just this amazing you know, journey with Wayfair that most CEOs of a company your size and scale don't, you know, you started it, you were there day one. As you think about 10 years from today, 
how you want folks thinking about Wayfair and the brand and what it stands for and the customer interactions? What does that business look like to you? Well, the way, you know, I think across our brands, Wayfair, our luxury platform, Paragold, All Modern, Justin Maine, Birch Lane, we're really focused on home goods. You know, that's broad furniture and decor, that's home improvement, it's housewares. But we want to be the customer's go-to resource for anything home. We think we can be the best place for them, make it enjoyable, help them find the perfect item, help them with all the services they need, make it convenient and easy, provide suggestions, have teams of people they can work with, whether it be on design ideas or whatnot. And so what I hope we would be is just the kind of well-known go-to resource for all things home. And we think we're building the platform that can be that. We think that's a huge opportunity. We think customers are incredibly passionate about the category and they just don't have access to great services. And so we just want to provide it for them in a way that's attainable, affordable, but easy, convenient, and, and great. And, you know, while we've worked hard at it and we get compliments about what we've accomplished, the truth is, you know, then this is part of our entrepreneurial spirit, but we view it as we've only just begun. And we only have 2% of the end market. There's so much opportunity. There's so many things we know we can still do better or things we haven't launched yet. So, you know, frankly, we view ourselves as just the beginning of that journey. Yeah. What would you say is the secret as a, as a co-founder that, you know, was there in the beginning and what did you personally have to do to keep evolving and how, and how did you keep just scaling the business so successfully? If there's so many businesses just naturally hit a ceiling or, you know, entrepreneurs that kind of hit a ceiling, what separated you and Wayfair that, you know, from such humble but beginnings, it's where it's at today? I, what I would say is, I think we're, on one hand, we're very ambitious, but at the same time, I'd say we're very good at listening to customers and trying to understand what customers want and, and figuring out how can we deliver that? And that may not, may not be easy, but what would we need to do to, to, to pull that off? And so we're, we're very ambitious. And the third thing is we're not afraid to change. So regardless of how we do something today, what we do or don't provide, how we're organized, what have you, we're willing to change it because again, our, our experience has been as you grow, something which may have been done optimally, almost inevitably is being done not optimally. And, but if you're willing to change, that's not a problem. You just recognize it and you evolve. But I think, you know, human nature, sometimes change is a tough thing. And so people try to forestall change. I think that can then inadvertently create their ceiling for them. And so I think being one hand, very open-minded and hearing what customers want, and then being willing to change anything as appropriate, that combo, you know, if you're willing to work hard, et cetera, it gets you pretty far. Yeah. What are the biggest things that you had to change when you, when you think of who you were as a leader and a CEO 15 years ago versus today? What are the biggest things that evolved and, and, and maybe what were some of the lessons that you had to learn the hard way, right? You talked about, you know, letting people go and doing that early on, like what were the mistakes that you made that helped you get to where you're at today? Yeah, I think, um, you know, in terms of the evol what, what, what evolves, I would say, you know, in the beginning, you know, part of what I think made us successful is, you know, Stephen, we'd get involved in everything. We'd know everything that was going on, be very into the details. Still very much want to know the details. It's impossible, though, to be involved in everything. So then you start realizing, well, you need to have leaders who can own things and drive things. And you need to learn, how do you start having good pattern recognition? Hey, here's an area I want to go dive into a little more. I need to, I need to get a better feel for that because I just, I'm not, I'm not quite sure I, I, I understand what's going on or I'm, I'm a little worried. Maybe it's a little off kilter versus how do you sort of have confidence? I think this is going well and just kind of cursory updates are sufficient for me there. And I, I, I don't think I'm missing anything big. Um, so that evolution in terms of changing your management style, your how you want to absorb and use information, I think was a big evolution. Um, honestly, just being hardworking, being customer oriented, being willing to change, being ambitious and entrepreneurial, and then looking for people who are like that and making culture. When we try to hire folks, we look for skill fit and then we separately look for culture fit. We have different folks screen for each. And, you know, if you're a part of an interview panel, you're assigned um, what you're, what you're, you're supposed to particularly, you're supposed to generally talk to the candidate and then specifically screen for something. And then there's a composite feedback. And the whole idea is we want someone who's a yes to both. And I think what mistake that we learned about years ago is you, if someone's really good at one or the other, you sometimes overlook the other. And 
you know, our hit rate of success with that was really low. So he said, well, you actually need yeses to both. And so even though the rigor in the interview process is higher, the, the value it creates is, is worth it. So, you know, that's, that's an example of something we learned. Do you have a go-to question in the interviewing process that maybe other folks aren't using that helps you identify who are the right fits? You know, Honestly, I'm typically fairly late in interview processes. So my, my generally, I'm just trying to get a feel for the candidate. They've generally um, done well in terms of uh, skill and culture fit. So then I'm usually trying to just get a feel for the person. So I'm, I'm always curious where they'd like to be in their career, what they'd like to do five and 10 years from now, not, not focusing in on the next two or three years, but a little longer. I'm often curious why their journey up till now has gone the way it was just kind of like, how'd you think about what you wanted to do next at each intersection? And so that together is stitched together this journey you've had so far. Um, so a lot of the questions I ask are to that end. And then um, I generally try to save a, a, a meaningful amount of time to let them ask questions. I'm both curious in the questions they have, frankly. And then, you know, part of my role is to make sure they're excited to join Wayfair. Yeah. All right. Last question I got for you. It is a very rare thing, these, you know, to be a founder CEO of a public company, especially at the size and scale that you're at. You know, what's the what's the perspective? What's the difference that you feel like the folks that are in your category have versus incredibly successful CEOs that you know inherited a brand and inherited a business? What, what what's that special vantage point that you have? Well, I think as the founder, you sort of, you know, the whole history. And so you, you sort of, there's a lot more content knowledge you have in your head of what all has happened, what you've learned, how you've made this journey and the twists and the turns. And I think entrepreneurs, founders typically are also um, the degree to which they'll move to innovation and just open-ended ideas is generally um, uh, more broad um, than someone who perhaps thinks of themselves as a steward of what's been built um, with a focus maybe on incrementally, uh, you know, growing and expanding it. Um, but honestly, you can find amazing leaders of any stripe. So I, I think overgeneralizing is, is actually uh, dangerous, but I would say for me, certainly knowing the history has been very helpful as we've continued to be ambitious and grow. Well, the history is amazing. The future sounds amazing. Neeraj, thank you so much for spending, you know, time with us in, in these two sessions and sharing your leadership advice and, and thoughts and wisdom for everybody here. It's just been a fantastic time. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. I enjoyed doing this. And thanks everyone for tuning in for our series with Comparably an Entrepreneur on Leadership Lessons and If I Knew Then Conversations. We're going to continue to have more amazing leaders like Neeraj and brands like Wayfair here coming up. And so, Keep coming back. We'll see you all soon. Thank you all. Take care.